We turn then to our chapter in the book of Judges and chapter number 14, uh, thinking this evening of Samson and as a type of the Lord Jesus. And in our experience and life, we have often come across people who seem to just have that extra gear, that extra level in their intellects, in their mind, in their ability. In those meetings, in those groups, at times we've been frightened to make a suggestion, to offer a comment, to say a sentence. We recognize that we are in the presence of those who are superior to us, who are able to look at a problem from a far bigger perspective than we are able who are able to offer solutions far deeper, richer, and more appropriate than we can ever muster or imagine. And in the presence of such people, we feel low, we feel intimidated, we feel second class. The wonderful thing and and the subject that we're thinking of this evening is that the, the Christian has this other dimension to our experience and our life. Not only are we gifted naturally, not only do we develop and and, and advance those physical gifts or those intellectual gifts or those moral ideas and perspectives, but we also have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. This is an added dimension, a level which unbelievers do not have. And it's this dimension of Samson and his life that's emphasized in this chapter and which we're duly following and focusing on this evening as we think of Samson as a type of Jesus. It is the the second aspect of Samson as picturing Jesus. Perhaps uh, the the, the phrase might help us as we think of this idea of Samson being a type of Jesus. We we recognize he has many defects, he has many failings, but just as a crooked stick can draw a straight line, so Samson points us to the Lord Jesus. And we are to see in his life, as we saw this morning by the echo of the phrases in Isaiah 7 and verse 3 of chapter 13, this correlation between some things in Samson and what we find in the perfect man, the supreme Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this emphasis on his life in relation to the Holy Spirit, is made within this chapter. In chapter 13, verse 25, we read, The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahan Dan. In chapter 14 and in verse 6, we read, The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. At the end of the chapter, in verse 19, we read, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Here is an emphasis uh, through all the questionable behavior of the Spirit of God coming on this judge, this Savior, this person. He is not the first that this is stated of in the book of Judges. We'll come to see in the case of Othniel that the Spirit of God comes on him. We'll see in the case of Gideon that the text says the Spirit of God in chapter 6 came on him. Here is a pattern. Here is an emphasis in the lives of these judges who are being raised up to serve God in this dark time that the inclination to do this, the ability to do this, the desire to do this did not come from themselves. But God came down on them and forced them, drew them, equipped them to fulfill this role. The Spirit of the Lord rushed on Samson. And so it's in this way, this dominant emphasis, this repeated emphasis on Samson's life that we have in this chapter, that we see the Lord Jesus Christ who, as we read, was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So there's three ways in which the Spirit worked on Samson that we see this evening. He stirred Samson, he steered Samson, and he strengthened Samson. And we want to emphasize uh, those three dimensions of the Spirit's work in his life, in Jesus' life, and in our life as well at this time. So let's think of this, this really interesting reference in verse 25 of chapter 13, that the Spirit of the Lord began to stir Samson in Mahane Dan. That this was a place just four miles from Zora, down to, down to Bangor. Not, not very, not very far, far away. This was a preparatory period in Samson's life. It was between his childhood and his adulthood. Those critical years. And at that time, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Verse 24 emphasizes that the Lord blessed him as he grew. The young man grew, verse 24 says in chapter 13, and the Lord blessed him. The Lord blessed him, the indication is, with a stable family, with godly parents, with health, with strength, those natural material things that he enjoyed. God blessed him in that way. But on top of that, additional to that, this special workings of the Holy Spirit was on him. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Maharan Dan. Mahane Dan, it was the camp of Dan. That's what the, the word means. It was most likely a, a, an outpost, a, a settlement, where soldiers from the, the tribe of Dan were situated. It was on the border with the, the land of the Philistines. And as Samson visited that outpost, as he went there, as he stayed there for a while as a teenager, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. The word stir is strong. It's connected to the word foot. And the phrase means to stamp the foot, to pound with the foot. And it indicates that the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit and Samson in his teenage life. There were these drives, these impulses, these desires being created within him. And no doubt it was connected to the location of this outpost as he went there and as he saw the Philistines, perhaps in their ridicule, in their mockery of his tribe of Dan and of the Israelites. We, we read in the text in verse 4, at that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. The Philistines were the superiors of Israel, the conquerors of Israel, the enemies of Israel. And as Samson saw this, as Samson was subjected to ridicule, to mockery, to the sight of of these enemies of God's people being the victors of God's people, the Spirit of God began to stir him, to resent this, to be angered with this, to object to this. We've been noticing that the, the, the enemies of Israel, the Philistines and Israel, were, were living in peace. The nation was content with the status quo. But the Spirit of God wanted to create animosity, tension, discontent with that. Here were God's enemies, the Philistines, the godless, the pagan, ruling God's people. What was this saying about the God of Israel? Was he weak? Did he not love his people? How dishonoring this was to the name of God. The people were happy with this. The nation of Israel was content to trade, to live in peace, to be side by side with the Philistines. And suddenly, the Spirit of God comes down on Samson and begins to stir him, to create within him a hatred, an animosity, a rejection of the status quo, a desire 
that God's people will once again glorify their God in conquering and ruling over their enemies. And so this experience of the Spirit is something like what Moses felt, wasn't it? When he went out from the palace of Pharaoh and he saw his people, the Israelites, as slaves in the nation of Egypt. And he was moved. He was stirred. The Spirit also was upon that man. He was discontent with this situation. What was this saying about Israel's God? Was he weak? Was he incapable of defending his people? Something like what would happen to the young David, the teenager, who went down with the refreshments to his brothers in 1 Samuel 17. And he heard the, the ridicule of the Philistines, ridiculing Israel's God, wanting someone to come and fight their great champion, Goliath. And no one would go. The people were content with being ruled over by the Philistines and mocked by their enemies. But the Spirit came into David's young heart and stirred him to take on the giant Goliath. And here is Samson, blessed by God, verse 24 says. Now he's been stirred in this outpost of the tribe of Dan discontent with this position of being oppressed and suppressed by the enemies of Israel. And creating within him is this desire to change. We're not into people coming up and, and saying to us, well, you know, the Holy Spirit said to me this, uh, Lower Mary Street's going to be finished in a year's time and 10 people are going to be converted in it in the first six months. We're, we're not into that. But what we are into and should be into is the desire for the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our life. For the leading of the Spirit. For the Spirit giving us ideas, driving us, empowering us prompting us. There's a wonderful passage in Martin Lloyd-Jones' book on preachers and preaching, and he, he talks about the, the minister in his study, and, and, and not all Christians experience this, and, and, but his experience was, and that was his role and, and calling, he, he says, at times, I feel this urge to pray. He, he's studying, he's preparing for the pulpit, but, but suddenly he feels this urge to pray. And, and he comments in that passage that every time we feel that urge, we should pray. Here's the Spirit stirring Samson. And this is what we want for our young people. He was a teenager at this time. He was between childhood and adulthood. The Spirit is stirring him, giving him spiritual interests, Spiritual desires, spiritual aspirations, discontent with the status quo. He wants to make a difference. He wants to serve God. And we should desire that they want to join the church. And we should desire that they want to serve in the church. And we should desire that they want to witness for Christ. We want to desire that in their life at this time, they experience the stirring of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit does. He comes on young people and brings these aspirations and longings within their hearts. And what we desire for the young people of our church, we're to desire for ourselves that we will not be content with the status quo, with the way things are. To, to live side by side with the world and unbelievers in our community and in our street, but that we will desire the kingdom of God to come, the powers of darkness to be pushed back, the kingdom of darkness to be suppressed and the kingdom of light to advance, to know the stirrings, the movings of the Holy Spirit for a vision, for an aspiration, for a desire for God to come and work and in power. Here's 
the first way in which the Holy Spirit worked in Samson, the stirring of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, the steering of the Holy Spirit. And this one is, is quite difficult to, to, to understand and, and get our minds around. It's in verse 4. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord. Timnaz, four miles west of Zora. And what Samson did here, I would argue, in marrying a Philistine woman was totally wrong. He should not have done this. We can't begin to justify his actions here. His parents point out the wrong of what he intends to do in verse number three. They recognize the Philistines are uncircumcised. They're not part of the covenant. They're not interested in the covenant. They try to direct him to, to, to woman, part of, of Israel, uh, that he could marry who followed the Lord and trusted the Lord. They recognize he's a Nazarite. He's separated unto God. And they desire that he'll live that out in his choice of wife. And so I would argue that we cannot justify in any way what Samson does in verses 1 to 3 in marrying a Philistine. The Old Testament law, Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 1 to 5 is absolutely clear that this was wrong. But he says in verse number 3, it's right in my eyes. That was his moral standard. That was his value. That was his guide. Going down to Timnah, the four miles from the outpost down to Timnah was all right. But in verse number one, being there and looking lustfully at this Philistine daughter, which leads to the marriage, was where he went wrong. But even this sinful action of Samson was overseen, superintended, as all our wrong actions are, by the Spirit of God. It was from the Lord. Not in the sense that God condoned us. He couldn't go against his clear law of Deuteronomy 7. But in the sense that God was going to use this wrong action of Samson to bring about the discontent, the animosity, the breaking up of the status quo which prevailed in Israel at this time. The very fact that Samson could leave this outpost of the tribe of Dan and casually stroll down into Philistine territory and marry a Philistine woman without any animosity, without any aggression, without any battle, without any difficulty, indicates the situation within Israel, they were happy in this position of being conquered by the Philistines, of serving them, of paying their taxes, of doing whatever they wanted, of answering their bid and their call. And God was determined to break up that situation. And he will use the sinful action of Samson to do that. We've heard a lot about Tina Turner and will hear a lot about Tina Turner over the coming week. And she looks back on her broken marriage, the difficulties that were there, which she's written a lot about. And she sees how, how all of that fitted in to the career that she went on to have. And if she could do it, how much more should you and I look back and whether we can see or whether we cannot see that our sins, our failings, those parts of our life that we wish never happened or never took place, not only do we confess them to God, not only do we seek and receive his forgiveness for them, but we also trust him that in his greatness he will even use them for some good. Here is Samson, 
going against God's revealed law. And yet, God is using this for his greater purpose and end. His parents were right. His parents stood up. His parents voiced their objection. His parents reasoned with him. And you and I should do the same. When others are going astray, we're not to sit back and and let them make a, a car crash of their circumstances. And that's what happened to Samson. It was a car crash. And he entered into all kinds of trouble and pain and problems. But even when others don't listen, let us trust God for ourselves and for them. That his greater purpose will be worked out here is the spirit stirring Samson. And here is the sovereign spirit of God steering Samson, using even his abrasive, aggressive, sinful, proud actions to fulfill his purpose. Thirdly, we have two examples of the spirit strengthening Samson. Verse number five to nine and the Spirit strengthened Samson in verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. What a statement that is. Here is Samson and his father and mother head, heading down to Timnah. Things have been arranged uh, by his father. And, and they're going down uh, for the wedding celebration. Timnah was built in a purposed uh, position that the sea peoples, the Philistines, not wanting to settle in Palestine, they had decided to settle in Timnah because of its fertile ground and their growing vineyards in that area. And here is Samson and his parents coming down there through the vineyards. Somehow Samson gets separated from his parents and this wild lion comes out of the vineyard without announcement and attacks him. What usually happened in those situations is recorded in 1 Corinthians 13 of the prophet traveling home and a lion comes out and attacks him and kills the prophet. That's the usual result. But in this case, it's different. In that moment, the Spirit of God comes upon him. And he, with his bare hands, takes on this lion and and rips it apart. And leaves it lying in the vineyard. Brilliant. Stop there, Samson. That's what we want to say. And that's what we've often said about ourselves. If I just stop there. But he doesn't. And that's Samson. And that's us. Strength and weakness. Walking in the Spirit and the power of the Spirit one moment. Walking in the flesh the next. He comes down that road again. And probably, possibly wants to relive that tremendous moment of victory over lion. That doesn't happen every day to someone. And so he goes back to see the carcass of the lion. Lo and behold, there the text says, behold, there's honey in the carcass. Despite the fact that he's a Nazarite, forbidden to touch a dead corpse. Once again, he bats aside God's law. And he scoops the honey up and tastes it and gives it to his parents without telling them where he got it and pulls them in to his sin. And interestingly, in this text, there is an echo of Eve's fall in Genesis 3. Saw, ate, gave. Eve did it. Samson does it too. Strengthened by the Spirit, but then walking in the flesh. And we are familiar with the imperfections of this world. We buy a new car and then we discover that the cup holders are in the absolutely wrong place. And out of all the good points of the car, this really annoys us. We buy a new settee, and after a few weeks, we discover it doesn't recline back far enough. We're familiar with imperfections in this life. 
And they're there in our cells. The spirit working within us. The flesh still resident in us. Noah builds the ark. What an act of faith. Outstanding, incredible. One among so many thousands who believed the promise and warnings of God. But he ends up drunk. Gideon delivers the Midianites, Israel from the Midianites with 300 men. What an act of faith and brilliance, outstanding godliness. Then he makes an ephod and leads the people astray. David kills the giant and then steals a man's wife. Samson slays the lion and then breaks his Nazarite vow. We've been there. We are there. Walking in the spirit and yet following the flesh. Fourthly, strengthened by the spirit, the second instance in verse number 19, and the spirit of the Lord rushed on him. Here's the wedding week. It was seven days. Uh, and when Samson came down, uh, we read in the text, when, when they saw him, verse 17, as soon as the people saw him, the people of Timnah, they brought 30 companions with him. Were they to help him in the preparations that the men seemingly prepared at uh, the wedding feast? Could you imagine that? Uh, the, uh, perhaps they, they saw that he was a danger. He was coming from Timnah. And they, they supplied 30 companions for him. It was a long week and so amusements were, were generally included in the week. And, and Samson comes up with this amusement of the riddle. The, these two lines, the six word riddle. And no one would ever get it because only he knew what had happened in the vineyard that day. And the Philistines, they were going to lose face. And they found out, it seems, that, that his wife wasn't too happy with the situation, that he hadn't told her the answer. For seven days, our text says, uh, that she was weeping. And they latch on to this, and they press her further, threatening her with burning. And eventually, Samson gives her the answer, and she tells it to the Philistines and they wait verse 18 to the very last moment of the seventh day when the sun was going down and that's when in their minds that the day ended and they told him the answer and he's angry and this is what the spirit of God wants the spirit wants this this status quo to be broken up. The spirit wants this tension. The spirit wants discontent between God's people and their enemies. And Samson goes the 25 miles down to Ashkelon. He's to get a, a suit of clothes for the companions, inner and outer garments. And rather than going down to the tailors and buying 30 suits of clothes, he goes down to Ashkelon. The Spirit of God helps him, empowers him. He has this animosity and the Spirit gives him the ability to fulfill his animosity. And he kills these 30 Philistines and delivers the suit of garments, the tension between Ashkelon and Timnah. And the camp of Dan escalates. They're seeking revenge they're unhappy. They're full of grudge and desire for revenge. And in our lives and in our hearts, in this pre-communion time, there's got to be that animosity with the enemy of sin. We've got to search ourselves to see if we're allowing sins to live in our life, if we're happy for them to be there. We're not asking for perfection. We're asking for repentance, ongoing repentance. Yes, we sin daily in word and thought and deed, but do we hate that? Are we discontent with that? Or are we happy for that to be the status quo in our life? God's people were dwelling with the Philistines, happy to do that, to pay their tax to answer their bid and their call, but the Spirit didn't want that, and the Spirit creates animosity between Israel 
and the Philistines. The Spirit stirring Samson. The Spirit steering Samson. The Spirit strengthening Samson. And so this crooked stick, and he is a crooked stick, and we all are, is pointing to Jesus. Who at the age of 12 was in the temple answering and answering asking and answering the questions of the rabbis. His heart was stirred. His heart was moved. The Spirit was on him, giving those spiritual aspirations a hunger for God's Word. And this is what we desire for ourselves and our young people. At his baptism, the Spirit coming down on him and empowering him for his public ministry, just as the Old Testament prophets and priests and kings were anointed with oil, so Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to fulfill his ministry. In Jesus, humanity is seen in its perfection and its fullness, empowered, enabled by the Spirit of God. And that is what we are to desire for ourselves. Ephesians 5.18 Be filled with the Spirit. The desire that the flesh is, is evidenced in Samson here, <coughs> evidenced in our own lives, will be subdued more and more, and that we'll be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And what we say and what we don't say, and our avenues of thought and, and how we pull them back from thoughts of pride and lust and our deeds. Denying the niggardly, filled with generosity and lavishness. Tina Turner has been vocal about what has enabled her to do all that she has done. For the past 50 years, she's been devoted to a certain type of Buddhism that's enabled her and empowered her to the success that she has. Here's our key. Here's our secret. Here's our God-given resource. The Holy Spirit indwelling our life. Let us desire, let us pray that as a congregation families will be filled with the Spirit of God.